So next up, moving into uh, our afternoon session, we have a powerful keynote speaker coming before us with When the Crowd Stops Cheering, Life After Sport for African American Male Division I Student Athletes. So let's put our hands together and welcome Dr. Crystal Beeman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am so excited to be here, and I'm really excited about this conference. I've been studying black male student athletes for well over a decade now, and I'm seeing these conferences pop up all over the country. I gave a talk at a conference on race and sport in Temple at Temple University in the spring, and then I'm here now, and I just really am excited that the interest in researching student athletes and talking about them in this way is really growing because it is so significant and there's so much continued research and attention that's needed. We're all here today because we collectively understand and we recognize the importance of sport as a key social institution. Whether we're talking about youth sport, collegiate level sport, high school sports, sports is a multi-billion dollar complex. It's connected to our culture, it's connected to our family life, politics, the economy, and it's a very, very powerful outlet. But more specifically though, this collective of people are here because we understand that there is a crucial intersection between race and sport that really needs to be discussed and needs to be researched. Well, for me, sport has always been the biggest part of my life for all of my life. I started running very young. Um, I was very talented, um, very young. By the time I was 10 years old, I had sponsors that were paying for my track trips and my equipment. I went on to get a Division I full track and field scholarship at Oklahoma State University after we recruited by a lot of different schools. And I left there as a track and field All-American. But I think more importantly, I left there as a Bachelor of Arts, a Master of Science, and a PhD, right? Awesome. And so when I think about those things, um, sports were very good to me. My whole household was that way, though. My oldest brother was six foot one by the sixth grade. And so his whole life was defined around sport and his body, right? My middle brother was the most successful of them all, of us all. Go clicker. As he was drafted in 1992, right out of high school to play professional baseball. He played for over a decade in the majors, minors, and the independent leagues. One of the things that I noticed growing up is that sport did not define me in the way that it defined my brothers. Although I was an excellent athlete very young, sport did not shape my identity. It didn't shape my goals and aspirations in the same way that it shaped theirs. I watched them struggle through their retirement. I continue to see my middle brother struggle as he finds out who he is after sport. He played so long that finding a career, finding a new identity has been a struggle his entire life. But look, my transition out of sport was nowhere near that tumultuous. My femininity wasn't wrapped up in sport. My identity wasn't wrapped up in sport. And so <clears throat> I just said, hey, I'll go run some triathlons, do some 5Ks, get some fitness modeling in. Maybe I'll do some personal training. I channeled my athleticism in a way that was positive, and it was not easy for me, to, or not hard for me, to give up my elite competitiveness. I didn't grow through this reformulation of identity and trying to figure out who I was. I saw this in my neighborhood as well. I grew up in Oak Cliff. Anybody from Oak Cliff? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we got that Oak Cliff connection, right? So I grew up in Oak Cliff, and let's just say we put out some athletes, right? And that small little radius of, of Dallas, Texas, we put out some athletes. Seen the movie Carter High? right there uh, set in Dallas, Texas. And I remember as I was growing up, all of us were athletes, girls and boys. We were all athletes. But the boys had just a completely different take on the way that they viewed sport for their life and their future, future success. The intersection with race and, between race and sport as it pertains to African-American men is a distinctly in, intriguing phenomenon. Over the last decade or so, I've been examining African-American male student athletes. I've looked at everything from their socialization into sport, their athletic identity development, their collegiate experiences, and most importantly, I've looked at their transition out of sport and into the occupational sector. Athletes retire for three major reasons, age, deselection, and injury. 
neither one of those three, three things are easy to accept, right? I'm too old, nobody picked me, or I got hurt, right? So it's really difficult at times to transition out of sport. Whichever those reasons of those three, it's a very young and early age in your occupational lifespan when you have to retire from sports and get, get a job or own a business or do something else. Additionally, this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone in this room, because of institutional discrimination in the sporting world, the likelihood that African-American players can find a career that's centered around sports is a lot less likely than their white counterparts. So we know that African-American athletes are overrepresented as football and basketball players. But if we look at coaches and decision-making positions at NCAA non-HBCU universities, we find that they're highly underrepresented as those in the position to make decisions. And we see the same thing, of course, for the NBA and the NFL. Overrepresented as players, underrepresented as decision makers. So this specific set of issues concerning African American males in the realm of competitive athletics in which their cultural, racial identity and their masculinity are oftentimes tied to athletic participation and performance. Even more interestingly, when we couple that with educational institutions, in terms of African American student athletes, there are really two opposing viewpoints in regard to sports and their role in the community. One is that it's a golden opportunity that gives athletes opportunities that would not have otherwise exist. Two, sports have exploited the majority of African American athletes. So although athletics has been seen as a golden opportunity for African Americans, there's really been compelling evidence to the contrary for many decades. Brother Harry Edwards and Arthur Ashe were some of the first to speak out at how this unidirectional focus on sport is really hurting African Americans rather than helping. There's no doubt that black sport participation has been positive for the group and it's been positive for American society as a whole. It did break the boundaries of civil rights. It did break down barriers and allow us to cheer for people who look different than us in the early civil rights struggle. I love sports. I wouldn't have had my life go any other way. Both of my children are active, successful, and talented athletes. However, this intersection between race and sport can be viewed as what we call contested terrain. That is, while sports offers opportunities from racial and ethnic groups that may not have otherwise been available, sports also blinds us to the disadvantages and the discrimination that also exists within in those same groups, both on and off the field. Additionally, serious involvement in athletics has been associated with, hinder, with hindrance of other areas of development amongst African Americans, and that includes educational and occupational achievement. Although African-American student athletes graduate at a higher rate than their non-athlete counterparts, like we just saw in Brother David's talk, they graduate at a significantly lower rate than their white student athlete counterparts. And so as we can see, this is all sports, um, and that's the entering class of 2005. So for black players, 49% graduation rate in white, 63 in all sports, football, 51 and 72, and basketball, 43 and 59. So there's a discrepancy between black and white graduation rates, and I think we're all aware of that. But some of the things that we might not be aware of, African-American male athletes have been found to have a lower career maturity than any other combination of groups. So lower than black women, lower than any other combination of groups. They've also been found to have an impaired aptitude to devise educational and career plans. Additionally, they base their self-esteem and their identity solely on athletics, more so than any other group of athletes. This is mostly due to male socialization process in which they're intensely socialized into sports by both their parents, their families, peers, teachers, schools, and of course the mass media. Many scholars, including myself, argue that this push towards athletics to the detriment of other interests as seen within the African American community is a hindering their both their social and academic as well as their cognitive growth. In my early research, I looked at a Division I football team in a major playing conference. I did a survey on the team and I found that 84% of the black players felt that they were gonna play pro. 70% of that group believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that they were gonna play pro. Oppositely, amongst the white players, 41% of the players believed they'd play pro, and only 39 believed it with the highest percent of certainty. So there's a huge difference there. Now, both groups were goal-descriptive, right? Because this is what it actually looks like. 
And we're calling it a funnel, but that is not a funnel. That's a waterfall, right? <laughs> They're not playing pro. Probably none of those guys are. That particular survey, the spring prior, we only had one guy be drafted and two guys land, land positions as free agents, right? But 84% of my players in that survey said, I'm going pro. 70% said, I'm going pro no matter what. That's extremely goal disrupted. Another thing that I found that was really intriguing is that particular piece of data was also connected to their academic achievement. The more likely they were to believe that they were going pro, the worse they did in the classroom. I also found that the more likely they were to believe they were going pro, the more incidences of behavioral problems they had on campus. Another thing that I found was these students' perception of their parents' emphasis. They perceived that their parents emphasized sport over academic the black players did a lot more than the white players believed. It was significant finding. This intrigued me. I wanted to dig deeper into those processes and dynamics that go along with the socialization process, their aspirations, how their college experience and professional experiences, and really how their retirement went. So I interviewed, and you won't be able to see all of this, but OK, help me out. There we go. Um, these are the guys I interviewed. They all have pseudonyms. That's a little information about them. Um, I know you can't see it, but I just want you to know it's there. Um, many of these guys have played professional sports at some level. A few would be household names. So if I told you your name, their name, which I'm not, um, you wouldn't know them, right? Um, I interviewed elite student athletes, and I defined elite in my way. We can define elite in many different ways, but I've defined elite as full scholarships at Division I A universities. Out of these Division I student athletes, in line with my previous quantitative study, I found that they were extremely goal discrepant. That means they had dreams to play in professional sports that were solidified at very young ages that weren't necessarily in line with their performance. Like Brother Drew talked about earlier, a lot of these athletes, even my walk-ons in my previous study, thought they were going pro, right? So they were extremely goal discrepant. Some were very in their 30s, still, still, <laughs> working out for their next big tryout, right? Um, one of them talked about parents really playing a major role in them wanting to play. So he says, about, since I was about six or seven, or seven or eight, I've been told I was going to play pro ball, and my parents were probably the biggest ones saying it. It was like I was seen as an opportunity for the family to get out of our situation. And so this kid at seven years old felt like he was the great hope of the family. And that was solidified by his peers, by, of course, the media, and by even teachers and coaches. Another responded that we see role models on TV, but having it reinforced in neighborhoods was even, makes it even more salient. So basically, there was an absence of other images of successful blacks in both the media and the real world. And this made them think that being a professional athlete was the way to be a successful black man, the only way. He stated, It's one thing to see people on TV, but like when you walk outside and you can see people that are doing something, that affects your life a whole lot more, especially when I was growing up. You know, and he named some of the athletes that he knew in his neighborhood. It was not something that was a question when I was growing up. It was real, a real opportunity. I mean, you looked around the neighborhood, and these were people who have made it. You can talk to them and touch them. I couldn't say that I can look around my neighborhood and see, you know, any wealthy people that had done anything else. No doctors, no lawyers, just ball players. So that image of success is almost exclusively an athletic one, both in the media and in their everyday life. It's no surprise that they had very salient athletic identities. They had strong self-identification as athletes and strong social identification as athletes. They were unwilling or unable from very young ages to explore any other identities, any other interests, or any other skills. They found it very difficult to reformulate these identities upon retirement. I th really think this feeds this, what I call the league dream, right? It feeds this frenzy that they're going to make it no matter what. African American males have an elevated expectations for professional sports careers. But look at the reality. Out of 40,000 black basketball players, 35 will play in the NBA, and seven will start. But let's look on the opposite side. There's 30,500 uh, 30, black physicians and 30,800 black lawyers in the 2010 census. Do you want to know how many black professional uh, sport 
uh, athletes there were in all sports combined? 3,500. So why is that our focus? We're more likely, highly more likely to be a neurosurgeon than to play in the NBA. But we have kids growing up their entire life focusing on that one sole ability. The thing that I think blows my mind the most about my research is that the athletes in my research, both quantitatively and qualitatively, are completely unshaken by that statistic. I can tell them that all day long. They can see it everywhere. You guys can tell them that at their, your life skills meeting at the beginning of the semester. They don't hear it. And I tried to figure out what is creating this dissonance. So I asked them um, a little bit deeper to, to talk about that. Why are you undeterred by that? And one of the things that they say is that it's not a dream. You're talking to me like it's a dream. This is not a dream. I'm going to play pro. He said, definitely, it wasn't a dream. It was like real. It was like understood. Not once did I see it as a dream. A dream is something you, you think about that may not come true. This was a reality. I mean, at 12, it was pro football, later pro basketball. So maybe I didn't know what sport I'd go pro in, but I knew I was going to play pro ball. <laughs> it was always a reality. Perry, another respondent, said this. He said, I'm going to go for mine. Whatever happens to that person is not going to happen to me, because let's face it, I'm a little bit better than he is. And also, another part of that, and this is the part that breaks my heart, because I heard this over and over and over. Another part of that is, what else am I going to do? I got to go for it. I ain't got nothing else. I ain't got nothing else I can do. I ain't got nothing else I can fall back on. They hold so tightly to these aspirations, not only because their identity is tied into it, because they're not, but because they're not fed that this is unrealistic by someone really important to them. A parent needs to say, you will not play pro. And that's a hard thing to say as a parent. Get what you can out of it, but you will not play pro. And that's a hard conversation, but no one's having that conversation with them. Seeing a statistic is very different than having a coach or a parent tell you, you will not play pro. And I don't care how good you are, I kind of think we need to tell them all that. You know, additionally, collegiate student athletes mostly, uh, they talked about these feelings of uh, exploitation in college. They felt like used goods. They use terms like spit up, chewed out, used up. One of the athletes, Tevin, says, OK, we've used you up, so goodbye, good luck to you. Don't come back around here no more. And this is how they perceive the universities felt about them. Another interesting uh, finding is that they felt like they were encouraged, if not forced, to emphasize sports over academics and other non-sport career development. They talked about this term student athlete a lot. Everybody say you a student first, but coaches, they want you to be an athlete first, then a student. All the respondents said that they should be called athlete students, not student athletes. They tell you, you a student first and an athlete next, but really you an athlete first and a student second. There's more emphasis on making practices and meetings. They hit you with go to class and all that stuff, but they don't care. As long as they get them four years out of you, they could care less if you get a degree or not. I think they have to care about, get, about getting degrees because their job depends on it. But personally, I don't think they care. The name of the game, the name of the game is to stay eligible, you know. What I'm, you know what I'm saying? I guess in the recruitment, recruitment process, when a coach or whoever he is representing the university is sitting in front of your parents, academics is stressed highly. However, when you get there, that is not the case. Another factor is choosing a major. Now, we know choosing a major is highly connected to your career development and your career maturity. Many of these athletes were not allowed to choose the major that they wanted. In fact, that was a common theme throughout most of my discussions with them. My major was just something I wind up getting. I started off wanting to be an engineer, but it's like the labs and stuff would conflict with practice. And because I was on scholarship, they figured mm, football stuff was more important than, I'm going, than going to class or truly being what I wanted to be. I kind of fell into my degree. Another said he was interested in architecture. I had an interest in architecture, but the thing about architecture, the school of architecture classes conflict with football practice. My friend lost his starting position who went on through with it and majored in, in architecture. Now, while the NCAA maintains that student athletes should be considered amateur athletes, driven by education, physical, mental, and social benefits. These athletes don't feel like that they are, that they are students. They don't feel like their education is being emphasized. And oftentimes, their education is being compromised by sport participation. So are they amateur in that respect of the word? 
Many of the respondents felt that colleges, college athletes should not be considered as amateur, and this affected their post-collegiate experiences. Most of these student athletes had a very difficult time leaving their dreams, aspirations, and athletic identities behind. Again, in my studies, I had men in, men in their 30s still working out to try out for professional teams. The reality is the average professional sports career lasts 3.5 years. Additionally, 80% of African-American NFL retirees are bankrupt within five years. So you will have to get a job, and you will be young when you retire. Black male student athletes are found to have lower life satisfaction after their retirement, mostly because their identities are so wrapped up. They've spent most of their time in, in college centered around athletics with tremendous amount of time constraints. Oftentimes working 40 hour work weeks excluding their sport participation. And that's year round because they have voluntary workouts in the summer. Their level of their time commitment leaves them not much time to explore any other identities. Thus, you see the respondent saying, I'm a baller. That's all, that's all that I am, and that's all that I know how to be. They talk about their difficulties finding jobs afterwards, going through six or seven jobs. I hear this, heard this over and over. I had no plans in place. I had no plans. I had no idea what I was going to do. I heard that in every interview that I conducted, and then those that I've conducted here recently as well. It was terrible finding a job. They constantly talk about that. They talk about being on a different playing field because they weren't able to go intern or take classes that would help them find a better career. But the biggest thing I think that bothered me the most and hearing Brother Drew talk about the suicide, I saw each of them talk about depressive symptoms. Two of them admitted to being suicidal. Out of those two, one attempted. I was depressed. It was the darkest time in my life and the lowest point in my life. I felt helpless, and that's something I heard over and over and over. Because we know as an athlete, when I get behind the curve, what do I do? I go work out harder, I train harder, I diet, whatever I got to do, and, I, and it makes a difference. In this respect, it's the first time in their life that they were completely unable to do that. They couldn't go shoot some extra jump shots, like he said. They couldn't do what they had to do. But more importantly, it's how the world viewed them. I mean, being a six foot six black guy, everyone asked me, why didn't you play pro? I really think this whole thing is harder on brothers, he said. <coughs> so we're an interesting time, I'll kind of scoot through here. So they talk about depression a lot. Um, so in sum, I think we've mastered how to help athletes be the best they can be on the field. I'm doing a study right now on youth elite athletes, which should be an oxymoron, right? Young elite athletes. And I'm finding that we are training athletes younger and younger to get the most beautiful performances out of them, the maximum performance on the field. But what about off the field? We give it a lot of lip service. But what are we as parents, educators, coaches, universities, and counselors really doing to make sure that our black boys who happen to be athletic are developing other skills, identities, goals, and exploring other interests? This is my son. They call him Big Trey. He's the big one. Um, he happens to be bigger, stronger, faster, naturally, than most of the kids his age. He throws a 60 mile per hour fastball at nine years old, consistently down the pipe, and he can paint the corners. What? Okay. <laughs> he can also hit it out of the park anytime he feels like it, and he does. He's been ranked recently in a recent publication as the number six youth football player in the entire state of Texas at nine years old. I have to continue to ask myself, as a researcher, educator, coach, and parent, how do I encourage him to be great on the field without letting media, peers, teachers, and coaches make him believe that his body and the performance of it is all he has to offer the world? What do we owe our athletes? Most of us seldom think about what happens to these guys after we're done cheering for them on Saturdays and Sundays. It's not as glamorous as we think it is for about 99% of them. What role do universities and professional sports league play in their development off the field? I'll tell you this, it should be a much bigger role. So the debate continues. Sport in the African-American community, golden opportunity 
or source of exploitation. One of the things that I do know is that we must learn to truly instill in our boys and our girls that sports, as well as education, are just a part of your story. It's not the story. It's simply a means or a mechanism to an end, not the end. We should never, ever, ever, ever look at sports as a possible career. It's not. It's a hobby. I tell my son every single day, if you make it, and that's a big if, it'll be for fun. You'll travel the world, you'll make a little money, but it will not be your career. Enjoy your little 3.5 years to the max, because that's about average of what you're going to get. If you don't make it, what did you get out of these years spent as an athlete? Sports simply cannot be your story. Thank you. Could we put our hands together one more time for Dr. Beeman? We've had phenomenal presentations from scholars, from former student athletes, from former professional athletes. But sometimes when we're studying the black male or black female plight, we can often get wrapped up in what's wrong and what's not going right and get lost in the challenges and the struggles. But when we have people who are doing it right, when we have a current student athlete who is doing it right on and off the field, how many know it's important to not only bring them to the conversation, but let them lead the conversation? They're a powerful resource to let us see what they're doing in their own personal lives and implement those same strategies into the lives of other young males and females who are struggling in the exact same position. So this afternoon, we actually have a powerful, powerful presentation from a young man who is doing it right on and off the field. You heard a little bit about him over lunch this afternoon. He's the current quarterback for the University of Tennessee. But before we hear from him and what he has to say and hear a little bit about his experience and what he brings to the table, we're going to watch a dynamic video. And the next voice you'll hear will be that of Joshua Dodge from the University of Tennessee. Thank you very much for the um, fine, uh, fine introduction. You know, it's uh, definitely an honor and privilege to be here. So good afternoon to Dr. Leonard Moore and the entire conference planning team, conference commissioners, athletic directors, coaches, academic advisors, and fellow student athletes. It's a tremendous honor to be here at the University of Texas and participate in the wonderful 2016 Black Student Athlete Summit. You know, ironically, even though, you know, the color orange around here is slightly a different shade um, that I'm accustomed to, it definitely feels like home. So I'm definitely honored and thankful to be here. Um, you know, as the video sh shared, I am Joshua Dobbs. I'm a third year student athlete at the University of Tennessee, majoring in aerospace engineering, minoring in business administration, a chancellor's honors student, and yes, I do play a little football on the side. So um, I am a scholar, I'm a leader on and off the field, and I'm an athlete. There's no secret that being a college student athlete is hard work and takes outstanding time management, balancing skills. With all the demands, it can often feel as though being a student plays second fiddle to being an athlete. The academic challenges that a student athlete face while pursuing the dual objective of excelling on the field in athletics and getting a college education off the field can be overwhelming. Like all, student, like all college students, we student athletes must balance our academic life, social life, and family time Oh, and also dedicate 30 to 40 hours per week to our sport. We have to divide our time be between classes, homework, practices, conditioning, treatments, team meetings, position meetings, film study, and traveling for games, and the list goes on. Sometimes being a collegiate athlete can seem to, in can seem to inherently contradict the goal to achieve academic success. It may sound impossible, but I promise you it's not. Lyricist Jack Kinder wrote, which one of my favorite quotes, it states, high achievement always takes place in the framework of high expectations. 
For me, the process of balancing this high wire tightrope of student athletics started at a very early age. I played competitive sports since elementary school, yet my parents made it very clear that my academics would be the priority and my athletics would be a privilege. My journey has been a path forged by God's grace, nurtured by my parents' unconditional love, and reinforced by their example of setting goals and achieving them. You see, I've been taught to view sports as a complement to, not a replacement for, my academic goals. So when I personally considered the proposition, how to be successful both on and off the field, four recommendations immediately came to mind, and I would like to share those. First recommendation, have a plan B. Every college student has the dream, every college student has a dream. For those of us who are athletes, those dreams usually include playing at the next level professionally. For many student athletes, that may be plan A. And there's nothing wrong with that. The, reali the reality, however, is that fewer than 5% of all college athletes will compete professionally after leaving college. So this means we need, a, we need to make time for plan B for what happens if the athletic career ends at the college level of competition. This does not mean we have to drop athletic pursuits altogether. It just means we should pay enough attention to the student part of our student athlete status to be ready for whatever opportunities present themselves after college. Second recommendation, we cannot just be passive participants in the pursuit of our goals. Rather, we must be active agents in the whole process. So manage your brand. Signing on to a college, signing on to be a college athlete automatically projects us into the spotlight, not only on the field, but off the field. We are the faces of our universities, and our actions reflect our institution and our sport, both positively and negatively. Many fans cannot give you the full name of a, of a university president, chancellor, and with all due respect, the athletic directors. However, I mean, if you offer them a thousand bucks. However, I bet if you ask them about their star cornerback or wide receiver, they could give you the full name, hometown, and stats for the past three seasons. This is why we have to make good decisions, especially when it comes to alcohol, drugs, and especially social media. Do you know what is one of the greatest benefits of our new information technology age? It's social media. Do you know what is one of the absolute worst aspects of our new information technology age? Yes, it's social media. Social media gives every one of us the platform and voice to communicate, market, and promote our message globally with a mere click of a keypad. On the other hand, social media also gives everyone access to our daily and private lives. That includes the trolls, the agenda-driven media, your coaches, and even long-term and potential employers. So one bad decision can negatively affect not only you and your future, but your team, your family, and the whole athletic department and your university. So build your brand to benefit you and understand that as a student athlete, it's not just about you anymore. You're a part of the greater whole. Third recommendation, make the most of a failure or challenge. As I shared earlier, as student athletes, we have the twin responsibility of challenging athletic competition and demanding academic expectations. No matter how hard we work, we will experience some kind of difficulty, whether that be a low grade on a test, an indifferent professor, a painful loss, a difficult teammate, or a non-supportive coach. There will be times when you feel hopeless, lost, or overwhelmed. Life will not always be rosy, so in those times, you have to resist the temptation to give up. Make a realistic assessment of where you are and focus on the things that you can control. But more importantly, never let anyone tell you you can't do something. No matter the obstacle, never lose faith or your hope. Don't let someone else's judgment define your personal goals because we each have the ability to move beyond our circumstances. And fourth and final recommendation, plan for life. During the frantic paces of our college years, it's easy to forget the big picture when our daily life is packed with academics and athletics. But we have to remember to use our resources and build our network. 
there are simple things you can do. Professors, on your late mornings when you have the luxury of sleeping in, go by and meet with your professor during his or her office hours. Talk to them and discuss assignments. Communicate with them in advance if you have to miss class for any reason, but especially for athletic commitments. Take at least two classes of the same professor, so when you need a letter of recommendation, you know the faculty member who can write a strong letter instead of just a form letter. Build relationship capital that can be saved and cashed in later when you need it. Advisors, get to know your advisors and meet with them regularly. These advisors are especially aware of resources for student athletes and share ideas of what helped other students succeed. And peers, be aware that other students who are not involved in team sports can get away with last minute cram sessions or all nighters. We do not have the leeway to put off our work until later, so don't get lulled into thinking you can do the same. Do step out of your comfort zone. Make an effort to cultivate friends outside of your, of your small circle of teammates and coaches. These, te these classmates can be resources to get notes and class materials when you're absent because of athletic activities. And down the road, who knows, one of these relationships or contracts will be an asset when you're in, out of college and looking for a job. And lastly, look for ways to get hands-on work experience in your major. I know you say, when do you have time? It can be accomplished by volunteering, or in my case, as interning during your off season. I utilized several of the points I just mentioned to you to get my internship last summer with the aerospace manufacturing giant Pratt & Whitney, as we saw. Now, of course, I first had to have the academic resume, but I also utilized the relationship capital that I had built in in advance with my Dean of the Department of Mechanical, Aerospace, Biomedical, and Electrical at UT's College of Engineering. I have been very fortunate to develop a relationship with him. We talk regularly. I stop by his office to keep him updated on my progress, so I needed a recommendation. He kindly agreed. As I conclude, I realize that, I realize that all that matters is the people you have impacted and those that have impacted you. Because of athletics, I've been blessed with the opportunity to come in contact with and meet so many people, like my brother Justin Blaylock, who are doing amazing things outside of sports. So as you personally contemplate how to be successful both on and off the field, remember that what you did in the past does not define your future, and life is about so much more than just wins and losses. When setting your goals, always aim high, and don't accept that the sky's the limit when there's footprints on the moon. Thank you very much, and God bless. <laughs>